NowDemocracyNow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we continue our conversation with legendary journalist Bill Moyers. I want to go back, since we're talking about broadcasting, right back to the Johnson era and then jump back to here, which is about the founding of public broadcasting and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, especially for young people, um, to understand why it began and where it's gone. Well, there were three. Believe it or not, I mean, nobody below 40 will believe this. You may not believe it, because both of, both of you are much younger than I am. But when I was, when I was 20 years old, there were three networks, ABC, CBS, and, 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 and NBC. And ABC was only half a network, no news division, all of that. And so we were dependent upon three corporate, advertising-driven, commercial uh, uh, networks for our information. And to his credit, Lyndon Johnson, who made his fortune, uh, part of his fortune, by controlling uh, the three he had one station in Austin that had a monopoly over broadcasting the product, the content of all three networks. I mean, that's how he made his money, uh, much of his money. But he really did believe. He was a teacher. He had taught uh, poor Mexican students in the little town of Catula, Texas. He was a populist from a poor part of South, Central Texas. South Texas. South 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 yeah, but he went to South Texas. He came from Central Texas, went, went to South, South Texas, Texas to teach in this Mexican school. And he really cared about poor, and he cared about education. He felt there should be one channel that was free of commercials and free of commercial values, because he knew what commercial values will do to people who are reporting the news, producing content, the desire to amuse and, 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 and entertain will cause us to compromise uh, the truth. So he, when the Carnegie Corporation and the Carnegie Commission John Gardner had been head of the Carnegie Corporation, and they did a study of what to do about educational television in this country. The report was actually delivered to my desk when I was still at the White House. The Carnegie Commission became the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. And I wish we had it here, because the speech Lyndon Johnson made when he signed the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 is a great tribute to a network devoted to the life of the mind, the life of the spirit, and the diversity of American voices. He believed that only white male straight guys got on national television in those days, and he was right. And he saw the value, the changing, the changes coming in America, and he believed there should be a public media that was devoted to the diversity, the pluralism of American life, and to the highest expression of the creative and journalistic arts. And the actual— uh, act of the uh, uh, creating the, the Corporation for Public Television talked about serving underserved yeah. uh, communities yeah. of America. And unfortunately, as you probably noticed, that there was a report done by Fairness and Accuracy in Media, a public interest group. Yeah, uh, yeah, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, Fair, right? right? Fair. And, and, and they showed that even on public broadcasting today, in our mainstream broadcast, it's usually the official view of reality that's represented. Far more corporate spokesmen than labor or working uh, people uh, spokesmen, far more white male figures of authority than people of color and, 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 and marginalized people. That's just a tendency of human beings that always has to be resisted. And, and public television, public radio belongs to the people. Go back and read a great document, the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. And when we stray from it, as we sometimes do, the public has to rise up and say, we own you, we are your shareholders, come back to first principles, come back to first things. So what has happened to public broadcasting right now, the onslaught? You talk about you just wrote a piece about NPR and PBS, and you talk about, well, Nixon first tried to gut it and then take it f forward. Richard Nixon tried to dis tried to he, he did succeed in, 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 in fragmenting our, uh, our authority because he didn't like I, he, I was on the air, Robert McNeil was on the air. He, he, we were doing journalist work, uh, but he called us liberals because we were trying to get at, at, at the facts. He, he, he and Pat Buchanan, his communications director, succeeded in, in, in 
harming, injuring public broadcasting back in the 1970s. Thanks to a great Republican who was chairman of the public television station in Dallas, we beat him off. They wanted to defund us completely, but, but they didn't. Then Newt Gingrich comes along, Robert Dole comes along in, with the right wing in the late 80s, and he tries to defund public broadcasting. Then comes Newt Gingrich in 1994, and, and now we, then we had George W. Bush and his team, who came after some of us on public broadcasting. Conservatives, on principle, don't believe that federal funds should be used to support the media. But then also they don't believe in allowing any alternative voices, any alternatives to the official view of reality to be heard. So they have always been against public broadcasting. And sometimes self-censorship occurs because you're looking over your shoulder and you think, well, if I do this story or that story, it'll hurt public broadcasting. Public broadcasting has suffered often for my sins, reporting stories the officials don't want reported. And today, only about seven, you know, a very small percentage of funding for NPR and PBS comes from the government, but that accounts for a concentration of pressure and, and, and self-censorship. And only when we get a trust fund, only when the public figures out how to support us independently of the federal treasury, will we flourish as an independent uh, medium. And yet you've managed to have a extremely successful career, both not only in public broadcasting, but for a while also in with the commercial network. I think, as I recall, you were the last person to do commentaries on the NBC Evening News. You were the last person to do commentary on the CBS uh, Evening News. And you, ha you had a string of remarkable do uh, documentaries. Uh, uh, even on the old networks, there were still documentaries that, uh, that had a, a major impact on how Americans saw particular social issues. H how were you able to accomplish that then, and why is it virtually impossible to do it well, now? I learned from Lyndon Johnson how to be a broken field runner, you know. I, I learned something about how to survive in a hostile environment. Uh, I learned some things from him about raising uh, money. Uh, I also came—Fred uh, Friendly, who had been Edward R. Murrah's great executive producer, the two of them created modern broadcast journalism. He was a good friend of mine. He nurtured me, a mentor to me. He taught me a lot. And I came in that—I was in the second generation of the pioneers of journalism. Edward R. Murrah I used to listen to on radio when I was growing up in East Texas. I listened to him on CBS News. So I inherited something of that mantle. Many of us did. And, and those of us—I was younger than most, but those of us who came in the wake of Edward R. Murrah and Fred Friendly and that first generation benefited from the aura that was surrounding the news as a result of their magnificent uh, uh, first efforts at, at, at broadcasting. And I was new to public broadcasting. Public broadcasting was new. I was fortunate to find sympathetic kindred spirits. I mean, I look out on this audience, and there's Barbara Fleischman, uh, who supports uh, Democracy Now!, who's been a supporter of mine, individuals and foundations who believed in an independent alternative uh, uh, media to corporate journalism. And I've been fortunate. I, I hope others coming along. I still believe in public media, still believe in PBS, still believe in NPR. Even with our faults and our deficiencies, we are still the alternative to the corporate media. We must resist encroachments. I mean, I, I saw a story the other day that perhaps in September, PBS con programs will begin to have underwriting contents within the broadcast. That would be a terrible step toward the slippery slope of changing the nature of public broadcasting. And we have to resist that. But we are still the place that respects you as a citizen and doesn't treat you as a consumer. The greatest change in politics in my time has been the transformation of democracy, America, from a citizen society, the moral agency of all those people in the civil rights movement who stood up against the weight of authority and, and against persecution and acted as agents of change. The change from a citizen's society to a consumer society, where most of us are caught up on that treadmill, trying to get more, trying to, to, to keep our head above water. And as a result of that, public broadcasting, which remains a place that treats you as a citizen and not a consumer, is also threatened. We must defend it. We must call it back to its heights, and we must continue to support it, because without it, we're at the mercy totally—except for the Internet—of corporate power.
I want to end by asking about your future plans. In 2007, you came out of retirement. In late March, The New York Times reported you'd received preliminary approval for a major grant to return to PBS with a half-hour show. But then in April, The Times reported you wouldn't be returning to PBS because PBS couldn't find a time slot for your new show. So this is what you told us um, in 2007, just prior to your return to the airwaves then. Well, the world's still here. It's still intriguing. Things are happening. I mean, I don't have retirement skills. I don't play golf. I don't play bridge. I'm getting too creaky to lean over and play with my little grandchildren. All I know to do is work, and as long as you're a journalist with two feet and two eyes and a good team around you, the work is endless. So here I am. And so here you are in 2011. What are your plans now? This gratuitous and generous offer from the Carnegie Corporation Remember, the Carnegie Corporation had presented the Carnegie Commission in 1965 to me <laughs> to turn into the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. And my good, dear friend, Bartan Gregorian, the Carnegie Corporation is, is president of the Carnegie Corporation he Foundation. He head of the New York Public yes, Library. Yes, head of New York Public Library. And I interviewed him when he was head of the New York Public Library uh, about teaching and learning on my show, World of Ideas. And we bonded, and I gave the commencement at his last— uh, uh, the, the speech at his last commencement at Brown before he came to be head of Carnegie, he came to see me and said, look, this is our centennial. Why don't you come back with some of those conversations like you see in Bill Moyer's journal? And if you will, we'll make a generous grant to prime the pump. And it was March or April, and I then called my other funders, because I have very loyal funders, some of whom are here in the audience. Now. And they said, sure, we will be glad to collaborate. But when I call PBS, their fall schedule is set. I mean, they have to work ahead. Television works that way. And they had they said, we don't have any airtime now. That may be a blessing in disguise, because my young team and I are exploring the Internet. I mean, that's a new medium for me. I'd like to live long enough to see. I mean, I started in print in a little newspaper in East Texas at the age of 16. Here I am, 77, in this whole new medium of social networking and, and Twitter and all of that. Uh, and um, we used to do Twitter. We just sent them as Valentines in, in, when I was growing up. <laughs> so maybe at 77, I will find yet uh, another frontier that will challenge me so that when I retire, the next time it will be for real. Are you uh, hopeful these days, despite the, 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 what we've discussed about the state of the media? We've obviously seen these enormous uh, uprisings throughout the Arab world. We've, on Democracy Now!, we've covered the, really, the democratic re popular renaissance that's occurred throughout all of Latin America uh, in recent uh, years, that there are parts of the world where things are hopeful. But right here, at home, in the United States, uh, things don't always seem uh, like they're heading in a good direction. I think this country is in a very precarious state at the moment. I think, as I say, the escalating, accumulating power of organized wealth is, is snuffing out everything public, whether it's public broadcasting, public schools, public unions, public parks, public highways. Everything public has been under assault since the late 1970s, the early years of the Reagan administration, because there is a philosophy that's been extant in America for a long time that uh, anything public is, is is less desirable than the public than, than than private. So I, I and I think we're at a very critical moment in the equilibrium. No society, no human being can survive without balance, without equilibrium. Nothing in excess, the ancient Greeks said. And Madison, one of the great founders, one of the great framers of our Constitution, built equilibrium into our uh, system. We don't have equilibrium now. The power of money trumps the power of democracy today, and I'm very worried about it. I said to her, and if we don't address this, if we don't get a handle on what we were talking about, money in politics, and, and find a way to to, 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 to thwart it, tame it, we're in trouble. Democracy should be a break on unbridled greed and power, because capitalism, capital, like a fire, can turn from a servant, a good servant, into an evil master. And democracy is the break on my passions and my appetites and your greed and your wealth. And we have to get that equilibrium back. I said